welcome to The World Transformed. I'm Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I am super fantastic. How are you, my friend? Man, I'm doing great. All right. You ready to talk some relentless improvement? Absolutely. Relentless improvement. And this was basically part three of our optimism show. Uh, we've, we've kind of been covering the last last two shows. Uh, are, are you saying we're going to actually wrap it up this evening? or what, what's the Nah, we'll, we'll never get done talking about outrageous optimism. I, I think as long as we're doing <laughs> a show, we're going to be talking about outrageous optimism. But that will kind of conclude a three-part series. And I should point out that we started it before we did all the Steve Wells shows. So if you listened last week, we did the first outrageous optimism. Then we did three Steve Wells interviews. Then we did part two, and now we're doing part three. So it's complicated. You got to just kind of take whatever we offer, I guess, really. You know, you just, it's, the future, it's hard to predict, especially with us. But this is part three, part three of a three-part series on outrageous optimism. And this, is, and this is the third part, relentless improvement. And I think these things all go together, Stephen. This is all kind of part of a bigger picture for how we get to the future we want. If we take outrageous optimism, which we talked about in the first show, and we add to that audacious action, that's one route to the future. And then it would seem that an alternative route to the future is just incremental change. Okay, So you, you can get really crazy optimistic and say, hey, let's go do this bold, big, new, disruptive thing, and we're going to bring about massive change. Or you can make things a little better today, a little better tomorrow, a little better the next day. That's kind of the whole better all the time idea. right? Those are both ways of getting from where you are now to a future that's better. But I think you actually have to do both. Okay. That's where, that's where we're going tonight, that relentless improvement is going to be about taking that disruptive, massive change, adding to it the continuous incremental change, and then you're unstoppable, okay? That's how you become this machine that is just barreling into the future. And I would argue that that's kind of how we've gotten to where we are today, right? It's kind of this constant yeah. handoff between those two things. What do you think? Yeah, and, and, this, and the improvements are, 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 as you said, very incremental. I mean, it could be that one person does something just slightly better and is able to market that in some way to others, and eventually that becomes the way it's done until somebody else finds some way that's just a little bit better than that, right? For, and provided you have a large enough population, things like that, you don't have a regression. Well, so, you think about it in a, global, in a global e economy, how something like aviation has come along. 115 right. years of aviation has got us from the, the Wright brothers and their very short, very sketchy flight in Kitty Hawk in right. 1903 to today, millions of people on a jet all the time, right? It's just, it's happening right. all the time. And that has actually been pretty much incremental improvements along the way. And that gives you a good idea for how big and how impressive those can be. But you contrast that with something you talked about in our first Outrageous Optimism show, which was JFK and his We Choose to Go to the Moon. That's disruption right there. Okay? Right. That is, we're not just incrementally improving on aviation. We're doing something completely different. We're doing something humanity has never done before. And we're going to accomplish something that was beyond the imagination of people in the recent past, right? So it's the whole thing, outrageous optimism, audacious action. And yet, how do you get there? Well, you get there through incremental improvement, right? You do Project right. Mercury, then you do Gemini, then you do Apollo. Apollo. And, and, and within those programs, even, each mission is an incremental improvement on the one before it, right? So it's almost right. like this, you, you make the big disruptive change, and then you immediately start making the incremental step-by-step -step changes to get you to that goal. And I think that over time, th that accounts for an awful lot of how, we've, how we have made such rapid progress over the past few hundred, or, well, I would say past hundred years, really, past century. Right. Think about uh, the evolution of the automobile. We can't go exponentially faster in an automobile now than before. Right. I mean, that's, uh, but think of the mileage uh, that you can get out of a car versus you know, even when we were kids, Phil, I mean, uh, if somebody turned, turned over 100,000 miles in a car, then uh, that was remarkable, wasn't it? Um, Absolutely. I, I have seen research that shows that if you buy the entry-level Volkswagen or Subaru today, right, just a Jetta or a, a Subaru Outback or something like that, or whatever the entry-level car is for, for any of those markets, you're actually buying a car that is safer, that has more power, that can accelerate better, 
name the criterion by which you want to judge a car, and it outclasses on every single one of those, say, the very top of the line sports cars from 30 years ago, right? Right. Um, it's, it's better in every way. If you could take that car back in time, it would beat them off the line, right? Plus, it would cost a lot less and it would be safer, right? If you have a wreck in it, you're probably going to live compared to, uh, c- compared to those cars. And that has been through no big disruptive change, but just step by step, right? Every year they come out with a new model, right? And, and they've improved it a little bit. Sometimes it just takes, it takes a, a while to understand that a, a particular change is, is significantly better and, uh, and, and then to be, end up being adopted across production lines of not just the one company, but, you know, now, think of the idea of something like crumple zones, right? I mean, there was a mm. time in the 50s and 60s where if you did something to, to make your car safer, it, you know, it was often the, you know, the marketing guys or, or, or various people would say that's, you're, you're making people think of automobile crashes. Let's not, you know, we, we can't market that the vehicle is safer. That's just, you're, you're bringing to mind the uh, possibility of an automobile accident. But of course, people are smarter than that. They know that when you get in a car, you're taking a risk. And so uh, eventually we do a respond. If we think a, a, an automobile is safer, we, we tend to include that in our, in our calculation of the value of a car, right? So, Absolutely. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think it's a, it's a big part of it is, the other side of that, I, I guess I would say, is that we come to expect it, right? We just we, we naturally expect cars to be safer today than we did back then without even really thinking about it, right? Because that that incremental change has pushed us to a point where we look at it and we go, well, yeah, of course the brakes are going to work, right? And it's not going to throw us out and the seatbelt's going to work and all those kinds of things. Things that people didn't take for granted, say, back in the 40s and 50s or even in the 60s and 70s sometimes. But if you look at that incremental evolution of cars, which has given us entry-level cars today that are better than top-of-the-line luxury cars 30, 40 years ago. That's cool. That has given us a lot of value. But then there are also these disruptive changes, these we choose to go to the moon changes. Like it was a little bit disruptive, or actually fairly disruptive, when Toyota started making a hybrid car. And then suddenly that was part of the landscape, right? Cars that could run both on electricity and gasoline. But then a bigger disruption when Tesla comes out and you've got this fully electric car and no gas at all, right? It's the, it's the, it's the working model of the electric car. Well, those are, those are big disruptions for sure. But I want to talk about another one, which I think really led to some big stuff, and that was cruise control. And nobody thinks about cruise control as being a big disruption anymore because we're so used to the idea. But that was a big deal when it came out. The idea of, yeah. you know, you can just set your car for going a certain speed and it'll slow, you know, it, it'll, it'll stay at that speed. It won't accelerate beyond that. It'll break when it has to, all, all those kinds of things. And it then evolved, right? Cruise control, yeah. it took on new aspects. It took on new features where you had auto braking a few years back that was introduced, where if you're tooling along and somebody in front of you has stopped and you don't notice, your car will stop anyway. Or kind of in the same vein, autonomous parallel parking, one of the most beautiful inventions ever, right? Because a lot of people have trouble with parallel parking, the idea of just push the button and your car will parallel park itself. Fantastic. Well, those were all incremental changes on top of this kind of model of cruise control. But then what happens on top of that is you've got the really disruptive change of just autonomous mode for a car, right? A car that's just driving on its own, more or less, and you're only kind of jumping in when you need to once in a while. But it doesn't stop there, right? Once you've got that, then you incrementally improve autonomous mode. And that's why the Tesla is really such a disruptive vehicle all the way around, right? Because it's disruptive on every possible count, right? It's well, and, it's, and part, partly because it, it can be updated at, uh, and, and is updated all the time. If the engineers come up with some way to improve the autonomous mode in a Tesla, well, you know, you, could, you can go to bed one night and wake up the following morning with a Tesla that's uh, safer on the road than it was be, you know, the day before. That's a really good example because you think about that time frame I was just describing. We talked about how cars got better. They put out a new model every year. But with a Tesla, right. you potentially got a new model every day, right? That's the, that's the speed at which the incremental change occurs, potentially. And yeah. it, it happens, right? You, you, a, a lot of times. The next day, you've got new features that you didn't have the day before. So in effect, that model of waiting a year for the incremental change has been replaced by a model of waiting a day for an in, in, incremental change. So that is the, that is the way technology is going to work from here on in, right? You want to know how weird things are going to be. Look at the Tesla and look how disruptive it is on different 
dimensions. It's disruptive because it's electric. It's disruptive because economically it comes from a startup, right? It wasn't even one of the actual car companies that that started the thing. It's disruptive because it has autonomous mode. It's disruptive because you can have a new version of the vehicle daily. It's, it's just the, weird it's any, way, any way you want to slice it. It's just a weird well, That's right. And that's it's right. beautiful. Beautiful because it's weird. It is showing us how disruption can take hold, right? How, how it can kind of become the norm. Because now you see Teslas around. It's not that big a deal. Remember when you first saw a Tesla, the first time you saw a Tesla on the road, and you're like, wow, there's an actual Tesla, right? Now it's like, oh, there's another Tesla. It's not, it's, it's not as big a deal anymore. And yet next time you see one, there's a good chance the person driving it isn't even doing anything. Right, they're just sitting there, and uh, you, you know, you're not only seeing a Tesla, you're you're seeing an autonomous vehicle at the, at at the same time. So I, I think I think Tesla is kind of a nice marker for us of that handoff between disruption and incremental improvement. How relentless that is a relentlessly improving technology, right there, the Tesla. Right. I mean, it is case in point for relentless improvement. It took. It took outrageous optimism to give us the Tesla. It took audacious action for Elon Musk to, to give us that business. And it takes this ongoing incremental improvement, handing off with disruption to give us surprising new things all the time. So it's a, I think it's, it's an amazingly good example. But there have been a lot of disruptive technologies over the years. You know, you could list them, the telegraph, the telephone, the radio, television, internet, email, the web, all the way to social media. Those have been big, and if you, if you go through that list, you'll see one of the interesting things that's happened is the time period between each next disruption is shorter, right, than yeah. the time frame between the, the previous ones. Or as some people like to show it, how long did it take to get to a million people using a technology, right? It took a long time before there were a million people using a telephone, not very long at all before a million people are using the latest app on a, on a mobile phone or something like that. So we're going to see new technologies, they're going to be even more disruptive than what the Tesla has done to the automobile. And of course, we talk about the three big ones all the time, the, the big dimensions of change that Bill Joy talked about in Why the Future Doesn't Need Us, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, and genetic engineering. Those are going to disrupt things beyond any disruption that's occurred in, from any technology leading up to this point. Is that fair to say? I would say so, yeah. Yeah, that, that any of those three is bigger than anything that's come before. And when you look at all three of them kind of playing off each other, you get into a really weird future. It's like Tesla, right? It's weird on all those different dimensions. That's how the future is. It's weird on all those different dimensions. It's weird on the material science dimension with nanotechnology, weird on the computer science dimension with artificial intelligence, and weird on the biological dimension with genetic engineering. Now, of those three, Stephen, I'm going to give you the big question. Which is going to be the biggest disruptor, would you say? You know, this is similar to the question you once asked a million shows ago, Phil. Um, you know, if I had my choice, which superpower would I take? And I, and, uh, I said super intelligence because you have super intelligence that gives you everything else, right? Hmm. Figure out a way to fly and figure out a way to be super strong, whatever. You know, you can be Iron Man, basically, if you've got super intelligence. Well, of these three, I would uh, say AI is the most important because, you know, that, that gives you nanotech. It, 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 it would power genetic engineering. I mean, if you... If you've got, if you've got uh, smart enough AI, that the materials tech within nanotech or whatever, that's, it's going to help with those things. Now, obviously, uh, in order to get to AI, you have to have, you're basically uh, you're making computer circuits uh, within the range of nanotech at that point, right? So, you know, in a way, you almost have to have nanotech to get to the AI. But these things feed back upon each other. And, For, and first time I ever saw Eric Drexler talk, he made that exact point. He said that AI and nanotech, it's a horse race between those two, yeah. that it could be that you need the nanotechnology to enable the technology that will give you the AI, that will then rapidly advance the nanotechnology. It, it gives you, you, yeah, it, <laughs> it, it advances back upon the nanotech. Yeah, it, it's sort of almost a chicken and egg deal, isn't it? You know, which, yeah, which but, but what if, first, but, just for a moment, yeah. what if AI is not the path to superintelligence? What if genetic engineering is, right? Yeah. But, but, but I think that's the trick. It's whichever one makes a smart fast and AI seems like the likeliest one to do that because the smarter you are, the more likely you are to enjoy the benefits of nanotechnology, AI, and genetic engineering, right? That's the, that's the key. How, whichever one makes you smarter faster is going to be the one that drives the rest of them and that drives all the biggest disruption because ultimately that's kind of what is disruptive, right? It's new unexpected smartness thrown into the world, isn't it? <laughs> that's, when, when we see the world being disrupted, it's because we're dealing with 
more applied intelligence generally in the world than we've seen up to that point. I mean, there could be natural disruptions for sure from storms and things like that. But when we talk about te technological disruption, that's what it is. It's smartness added to the world. And if anything's going to do that, I think I agree with you. It's probably artificial intelligence, right? Yeah, I think that's so. going to okay. that's going to be the one that'll give us the nanotech. That'll be the one that'll give us the genetic engineering. But as we've said many times, you can expect those three things to be playing off each other and making weird things happen. The Tesla is kind of a good model of that. When you look at different dimensions of change all playing out in one space, that's kind of what's going to happen with those three. They'll look like three different spaces sometimes, and they'll look like one space all kind of all kind of impacting each other at other times. So there it is, relentless improvement, outrageous optimism plus audacious action, that is to say disruptive change plus incremental change is going to give you the future. And with that, Stephen, I think we're, we're done for now with outrageous optimism. All right. Well, we will revisit this. Thanks, Bill. This has been great. It, this is fun stuff, and we will definitely come back to this down the road because, for one thing, it's just one of our favorite topics. All right. We're going to be back <laughs> next week. Look forward to being with you all then. And until next time, live to see it. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. Please click the subscribe button below, and you'll get an update every time we have a new video out. Also, check out some of our archive videos. You know, we've done more than 800 shows, so you got a lot of catching up to do. Better get started.